ladies and gentlemen, uh, it's time uh, for our this session. Please uh, have a seat. Is more than our a session thing. will it's a begin and right now. Hello everyone, good afternoon. I'm uh, John uh, Zhao, I'm the uh, Director of uh, uh, External Relations of uh, CGG and I'm also the Program Manager of a Global Young Leaders Dialogue Program, uh, which is also initiated by the CGG. And uh, today, I'm uh, very honored to welcome, you know, the friends from, uh, and experts from uh, international and domestic uh, to join this uh, very important session. Uh, we can see under this uh, unprecedented uh, changes of uh, uh, the past century, uh, the flow and the distribution of global talents uh, has also shown some new trends. And how to grasp the new trend of uh, global talent flow and promote international talent exchange and uh, cooperation and promote the United Nations uh, 2030 agenda, you know, SDG, uh, is deserve uh, in-depth uh, discussion. So based on that, uh, the Center for China and Globalization and the Alliance of Global Talent Organizations, uh, which is uh, non-governmental non international uh, organization, uh, you know, aiming for to do the uh, global talent uh, mobility governance. So we jointly hold uh, this session on the theme of uh, global talent mobility and, uh, and governance at uh, the 10th edition China and Globalization Forum. So uh, today we have uh, the uh, experts from international organization like uh, uh, OECD, LM, and we also have uh, experts uh, in the uh, talent, uh, you know, research area, industry area. So uh, I, I believe uh, today's session will be a very fru a fruitful session. And, um, uh, but uh, the time is uh, <laughs> very li limited. My colleague even said, uh, John, you know, you have uh, so many uh, uh, speakers today, you cannot finish it uh, in uh, 145 minutes. Uh, so I really, you know, uh, I hope you can, you know, help me and join me to make these things happen. Uh, so without uh, further ado, I will uh, invite our uh, 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 CCG Secretary General uh, and also the founder of uh, Global Young Leaders Dialogue and also the uh, uh, Secretary General of uh, 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 Alliance of Global, uh, uh, Global uh, Talent Organization. Dr. Mabel uh, Miao to give the remarks. Welcome. Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Welcome to the 10th China and Globalization Forum once again. Um, I know John mentioned time is limited. I will save time for you <laughs> and for our panel. Uh, we're pleased to host so many dear friends from different countries, people from OECD, from UN, from different sectors. We are so proud of uh, our uh, event can host so many distinguished guests. Uh, people know that CCG is good at to the people mobility and the global governance issue, especially on the topic of people mobility. Um, when, when people ask, uh, ask me, uh, you are the co-founder of CCG, what kind of topic are you good at? Usually I will mention global governance, especially on the people mobility. And we believe there are uh, two pillars for global governance and globalization. One is the people mobility. Definitely. Another is uh, enterprises going global, inbound, outbound, and the multinational companies. So uh, on this event, the two pillars are very, very prestigious topics. So I'm so proud to mention uh, this, and uh, uh, congratulations again, our colleagues uh, who are interested in this topic. And, uh, as I prepared uh, today's opening remark and the welcome remarks in Chinese, let me 
uh, speak in Chinese. And uh, some colleagues complained to me that this is in China. You should speak Chinese as well, not just English. So I would like to combine it. Madam Viewer. Madam Himofar. Madam uh, Representatives, ladies and gentlemen, first on behalf of the AGTO and CCG, I would like to extend my warmest welcome to all of you. Talent mobility is an important feature of globalization. It has not only promoted technology exchange and knowledge exchange, but has also promoted the interactive development of globalization. The cross Boundary mobility of talent has brought innovation and expertise to all countries. That is a good impetus to the technological progress of all countries. Despite the COVID-19 and geopolitical challenges, global talent mobility is still showing a strong trend. According to the UN statistics, in 2020, Immigrants reached 220 million, accounting for 3.6 percent of the global total population, up by 100 million over the previous years. So that shows uh, uh, mobility is a big trend. That is uh, a very obvious trend. However, we are still facing a lot of inequalities. A lot of developed countries have attracted more talent by issuing more policies, but the South. South countries are facing the losses of talent. According to the United Nations relevant organizations and the IM, uh, the International Refugees Organization, uh, in the top 20 refugee corridors, many of the corridors lead from the south to the north, for, for example, from Mexico, India, China, and the Philippines to the United States, and from Turkey to Germany, from Algeria to France. And these are the corridors leading to the north. That shows the loss of talent from uh, the southern countries. This is a big challenge. We always talk about the south-north gap. Usually we say it is an economic gap. However, talent mobility or population mobility is still having a big impact on the economy. So I think we need to pay more attention as the academia to this topic, and uh, we need to put it into the context of uh, migration. And uh, CCG has always been promoting research on this topic. We have been working together with the IOM. We know Madam Li Wen is here. Since uh, 2012, we have been translating the report into Chinese, and we have been issuing these blue books. And at the Shanghai Expo, we have held uh, the Global Mobility Forums to issue the global talent trains and research reports as our economic results. And we have contributed our insights. And I still remember that I accompanied the National Migration Administration to OECD to explore the experiences of uh, the OECD countries so that uh, their experiences can be shared with China. And uh, also at the Paris Peace Forum, uh, the AGTO was launched, an international non-government organization. It is an organization for organizations aimed at promoting talent exchange, cooperation, and communication or in order to contribute to global talent governance. I'm looking forward to the sharing today. And uh, we will also disseminate the outcomes of our discussion today so that we can work together to ensure that global mobility will move in a equitable and sustainable way. Finally, I want to thank you again for your coming, and I wish this forum a complete success. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Mabel. Yeah, as the Mabel said, the, the talent mobility or the people mobility is still the trend, uh, the, the main trend, even the, this uh, turbulence time. So next, I would like to, you know, it's uh, our honor to invite uh, uh, the chief of mission for the International Organization for Migration in China, Ms. Li Wen, to give the remarks. Thank you.
Dr. Miao, distinguished participants, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. It's my great pleasure to join this Global Talent Mobility Governance Forum. Global talent mobility is a key driver of economic growth and innovation. We are now seeing more and more countries taking initiatives, including in the areas of visa, social protection, and citizenship, to create a more competitive and attractive environment for global uh, talent and to address the skills, gaps, and shortages they face. The governance of global talent mobility requires coordination and cooperation among multiple actors and stakeholders, government, civil society, uh, private sector, etc. Moreover, global talent mobility is influenced by a complex and dynamic set of factors, such as the demographic trends, technological changes, labor market conditions, migration policies, and cultural norms. The governance of talent mobility requires a comprehensive and holistic approach, one that can balance the interests and needs of different countries and groups and promote fair and ethical practices. In this regard, the Global Compact for Safe, Orderly, and Regular Migration, GCM, the most comprehensive international migra uh, migration agreement adopted by the UN General Assembly, provides important guidance. The GCM addresses the need to enhance the availability and flexibility of pathways for regular migration. Efforts are needed to streamline procedures to make existing pathways more accessible and information more available. Developing international and bilateral cooperation arrangements to optimize effective skills matching and facilitate recognition of qualifications, as well as promoting options for academic mobility. Equally, if not more important, is the retention of talent. The GCM emphasizes the importance of empowering migrant inclusion. Though approaches to integration vary across countries and regions, integration policies are generally more effective when they take a whole of community approach and when there's a clear understanding of expectations and obligations from all involved migrants and the receiving society, including authorities at the local, regional, and national levels. Some good practices include developing national policy goals regarding the inclusion of migrants in societies, including labor market, education, and health, promoting mutual respect for the cultures, traditions, and customs of the communities of destination and of migrants, and fighting all forms of discrimination against migrants as well as creating an enabling environment for civic and political participation of migrants to the extent possible. To ensure origin countries also benefit from global talent mobility, it's important to introduce policies that facilitate diaspora members and returning migrants to take part in social and economic activities in origin countries. In a con continued state of involvement, global talent migrants can help not only in the traditional sense of financial remittances, but also in social remittances by transferring knowledge and fostering innovation in origin countries. IOM's Strategic Plan 2024 to 2028 has identified facilitating regular pathways for migration as a priority. As the UN Migration Agency are present in more than 170 countries around the world, I am in collaboration with other partners, have, has been implementing wide-ranging programs to facilitate global skills partnership on migration, support the creation of regional talent hub, improve social protection of migrants, as well as strengthen diaspora engagement. I am commenced the policies and measures to adopt in recent years by the Chinese government at different levels to facilitate talent mobility and we stand ready to leverage our expertise and partnership to support China's efforts. I look forward to productive discussion this afternoon. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Ms. Lee. Uh, I'm, I'm, uh, really uh, produced their flagship uh, you know, report and uh, policy suggestions and uh, uh, help China a lot on this uh, you know, uh, policy and uh, migration issues. Uh, so next part, we will uh, have our uh, uh, keynote speech session. The first speaker uh, uh, is the head of the International Migration Division, 
uh, Direction for Employment, Labor and uh, Social Affairs, uh, OECD, uh, uh, Mr. Jean Christopher Dumont, please. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, it's a great honor and pleasure to be here with you and share some thoughts about uh, international competition for talent from the OECD perspective. I will have a mixture of uh, slides on, on data and on, on policies to, to make uh, a few points which hopefully will be useful in the Chinese context. Let me start with numbers. 10.6% of the population in OECD country is foreign born, and this is uh, on the increase uh, as it is, uh, it was less than 9% uh, in uh, 2012. Um, but more importantly for our event, uh, the share of tertiary educated among migrants in the OECD has been increasing very rapidly. It's now four out of 10 migrants in the OECD who is tertiary educated. And you can see on this slide for some countries like Canada, where it's 65%, 60% in Australia, or over 50% in UK and Ireland, most migrants now are tertiary educated. Um, what is more is that this share is continuously increasing and if we compare these numbers to 2010 numbers, uh, it's uh, a jump of uh, nine percentage point in terms of a share, so it was 31%, now it, it's 30, 40%. But in some countries, uh, the increase in the share of tertiary educated migrants have been more steep, like in Poland, plus 20%, uh, in the UK, Portugal, Slovak Republic, Australia, plus 12%, and uh, there is a long list of countries with a uh, higher share of, um, of tertiary educated migrants every year. And finally, uh, important to have in mind that not only tertiary educated migrants, but altogether migrants are in large number coming from uh, Asia. One in three migrants in the OECD was born in Asia. But as you can see again from this chart, there are uh, five countries where more than 50% of the migrants are from Asia, Turkey, Canada, Australia, Japan, and Korea, and uh, eight more countries where uh, the share is uh, over 30%, uh, including uh, countries uh, in the northern part of Europe, uh, such as Finland, Sweden, and and Norway. Um, so this was about the stocks, but now if we look at the flows, uh, it's very important, and I don't want to go into details, there is more in the OECD flagship publication on migration, international migration outlook, uh, to have in mind that uh, migration post-COVID has been increasing extremely rapidly. So in 2022, the latest uh, consolidated numbers that we have there was more than 6 million new permanent immigrants to the OECD. And you, as you can see on this graph, this is uh, significantly more, 14% more than before the COVID crisis in 2019. Uh, permanent migration increased by 26% in 2022. But temporary, uh, temporary labor migration increased in 2022 by 77%. And international students flows increase in 2022 by 42%. So, and I'm not talking about asylum here. Um, we don't have yet the numbers for 2023, but uh, I can already tell you that this number will show a further increase. And in some countries, significant one, notably when it comes to labor migration. So, um, in China, however, we have only partial data. It seems that, uh, the flows have not re fully recovered from COVID. And for the numbers we have here from Hong Kong, you can see that there were about 42,000 uh, work permit delivered in 2019, but only uh, 18,000 in 
yet 2023. So obviously COVID has stopped migration everywhere. In most OECD countries, the rebound has been immediate and very steep. In China, it seems that it takes more time and the same applies to international students and we'll talk about that a bit later. What is also clear is that this increase in migration is taking place in a context where there is uh, higher demand for foreign labor everywhere. That comes from a conjunction of factors uh, which are uh, due to increasing demand in, in high skill migration, but also increasing mismatch between supply and demand in most OECD countries. And earlier, this is due to rapid aging of the population, de declining you know, labor force, but also increasing demand in certain sectors, notably in care. It's about the very strong impact on labor of the post-COVID recovery plans that OECD countries have put together. It's about the green transition, which is affecting uh, very severely the nature of the demand inside the sector, I'm thinking notably uh, in the manufacturing sector and energy. Um, but it's also increasingly due to the very rapid digitalization of the economy already. Uh, the COVID pandemic has accelerated uh, this transition. Uh, very few of us were working online using Zoom before COVID. Now it's... Uh, it's normal practice, but uh, what is more, uh, the emergence of uh, generative artificial intelligence, uh, chat GPT and others, is really transforming extremely rapidly the labor market in most OECD countries. OECD now estimates that 27% of all occupation at, at risk of uh, being automated uh, in the next uh, decades or so. Uh, so all that together creates a big mismatch in the labor market and, and a lot of uh, employers uh, are facing difficulties to find the skilled worker they need. And if we believe this survey from Manpower Group, um, actually the percentage of employers who are reporting these difficulties has doubled since 2015. It's now 77% on average globally. It's about 81% of Chinese employers but it's also 80% of employers in the UK, Australia, or Canada. So skill shortages is really everywhere, and the need for foreign talented workers uh, is, is a common feature of, of our economies. OECD countries have been adopting since many years different programs to attract talented migrants. Uh, it's not the time now to go into the details of these uh, of his programs. Some are extremely successful, some others are, are less. Um, but I think what is important is that even in countries which have long established policies uh, uh, to attract international talent, they are making special efforts uh, to do more. One typical example is uh, not, not on that slide, but still, wants to, still want to, to mention it, the UK, which has uh, introduced the high potential visa in 2022, but also uh, for a number of reasons has developed this uh, British National Overseas Program that has brought to the UK 150,000 people since June 2023, so only in a few months, including 120,000 people from Hong Kong, China. But here you have another program uh, from Australia, the Global Talent Program that comes in addition to the uh, skills independent or employer sponsor schemes of Australia, which aims are targeting uh, very highly skilled people, uh, uh, notably uh, with different type of profile, uh, uh, maybe people with not necessarily very high education, but very high potential. Um, you have, in Canada, very proactive programs to attract tech talent, notably to take advantage of the inaction in the U.S. There hasn't been any change in the U.S. law on migration since uh, 1990. Uh, and certainly, uh, 
Canada is looking at opportunities to attract from the US immigrants, uh, talented immigrants, uh, notably uh, H-1B uh, visa holders, as well as international students. But interestingly, in this strategy, Canada has also created a new position of Chief International Talent Officer, which aims at leveraging information about skills, needs, and ensuring that immigration better aligns with Canada's labor market. So there is really here not only a uh, question of, of uh, visas and programs, but really uh, the intention to uh, to be more efficient in the alignment between the labor market and, and uh, the immigration policy. In Germany, in 2023, uh, was enacted the new German labor migration law, um, which covers a number of things, uh, including revision of the uh, condition of application of the blue card to Germany with lower salary threshold, and uh, less requirements in terms of uh, higher education uh, that can now be substituted by uh, uh, professional experience. Uh, but also a number of facilitation regarding unregulated professions. Uh, so we're not necessarily talking very, very highly skilled people here, but more technician level, uh, as well as uh, what is called an opportunity card, which will enable for the first time in Europe uh, people without a job uh, to come and look for a job for one year in, in Germany. So it's a paradigm shift in a way in the German context and certainly uh, uh, another player uh, in the international competition for talent for a country which is already number two in terms of immigration to the OECD right after uh, the United States. Um, but the EU uh, altogether is also very proactive. Uh, uh, this is uh, Li Wen mentioned the uh, skills mobility partnership. Uh, in part, I mean, there is a lot of talks about the EU migration pact, which is focusing on irregular migration and asylum. But there is also also a lot of activities at the EU level, and maybe we, this is discussed in the room next door um, about. Uh, about talent mobility and the creation of this EU talent pool, which was launched by the Vice President, uh, Mr. Chinas, from the Commission. And I think this is testify the importance that they uh, put on, on, on this uh, topic is, uh, is one element of, of this strategy. It will still take some time before this is uh, becoming fully operational. Uh, but I think it's another uh, example of, of a proactive actions that OECD countries are taking to attract talent from, from abroad. So uh, one, one key element of this strategy everywhere is international students. International students have been uh, increasing uh, steadily in all OECD countries. We now count more than 4.5 million international students in the OECD. Uh, and in most countries, the share of international students among all students is higher than the share of uh, migrants in, in the population. So there is a specific uh, uh, effect uh, of, uh, in terms of attracting uh, international students. Um, not going too much into details, but uh, you can see here that, again, Asia is, uh, is leading. Uh, we account about... Uh, 40% of all international students who are coming from Asia, uh, but very specifically, uh, China is number one. One million international students in the OECD. One in four, about one in four international students in the OECD is Chinese. Um, so you can see that this is twice more than the number two, which is India, which has a bit less than 500,000 international students. Um, I think uh, part of the strategy to attract international students is to enable them to stay uh, and then feed the talent pipeline uh, uh, with at the end work visa and maybe access to long-term residence and citizenship. Um, OECD countries have all measures to facilitate transition from study to work. Uh, sometimes uh, 
uh, these are extremely generous conditions, but in most countries you can stay up to one, two years uh, to look for a job that uh, is aligned with uh, your initial uh, um, studies uh, before you transition to, to a work permit. We have done some analysis of a stay rate of international students and what we find is that on average, after five years uh, for Canada or Germany, uh, about 60% of the international students are still in the country. And after 10 years, uh, we're talking about about 45 to 50%, almost one in two still in the country. So yes, these countries are very successful to attract international students. They are also quite successful in retaining them. And when we look specifically at Chinese students, well, in Canada, typically after five years, the retention rate is not 65%, but uh, is 75%. It's lower than for Indians, as you can see from this graph on the lower end of the slide, but still higher than for average international uh, students. Uh, it's also very high in countries like Australia, New Zealand, and Japan, where Chinese students tend to stay, more than one in two Chinese students tend to stay after five years. So certainly, uh, this is uh, also connecting to the next presentation, but a very important in the talent attraction, uh, um, uh, let's say, strategy of countries. Um, I will share with you very briefly, because this is not uh, specific for China, some results from some indicators of talent attractiveness that we have developed together with Beltosman Foundation. Starting with a result of a survey that we did uh, for people who are uh, looking to come to Germany, we asked them what is the country of their dream? So what matter most? These are people who are logging on the German website making it Germany, who, are, uh, who want to come to Germany as a migrant, different type, and uh, respond to this survey about you know, what is the most important thing for their preferred destination country. And actually, uh, you know, higher salaries only come seven in this list. Number one is education system, obviously for children. Number two is healthcare and social protection. Number three is positive attitude towards uh, migrants. And then comes public infrastructure, better opportunities for family. The employment condition obviously plays a role, but it's not necessarily central. If you want to attract talent, you need to have a strategy that goes beyond career and work opportunities. So the, talent, the indicators of talent attractiveness, which I will present in one minute very, very briefly, are based on a uh, multidimensional uh, uh, aspect uh, in, in relation to what I just mentioned, looking at the quality of opportunity, income and tax, but also future prospects, family environments, skills environment, inclusiveness, quality of life. And we have separated these indicators in four categories. One is for highly skilled workers, another one is for entrepreneurs, international students, and startup funders. So when it comes to highly skilled workers, number one is New Zealand, followed by Sweden and Switzerland. So you can see, small country can be extremely attractive. Um, US is number eight, Canada is number 10. Uh, it would be certainly interesting to see how China fits into this uh, graph, uh, but for that, we would need to do some specific analysis. Uh, so for entrepreneurs, uh, more or less the same Trio de Tete, uh, same countries at the top, uh, Sweden, Switzerland, and, and Canada, so in a different order, New Zealand lose a few ranks. Uh, more importantly, maybe for this discussion, is international students. Without surprise, too much surprise, United States ranks number one, Germany number two, United Kingdom number three, but you can see at the bottom of this list, appearing Korea and Japan. Interesting, I think, uh, to see that Japan is number eight. Uh, so again, it will be nice to see where China fits in comparison on this list. And for international, uh, uh, for founders of, of startups, uh, the, the ranking is a little bit different. Uh, Canada, US, UK are still top, but France is now number three. 
And this is because France has been extremely proactive to attract startup funders. They have a lot of uh, um, programs and provision to make it very, very easy for startup funders, not only themselves, but their family and their employees to come to France. And uh, that puts them very high in, in this list. So let me just end this presentation uh, with the way forward. I think my key message is basically that it's not sufficient to have an open door policy to attract talent. And it's not sufficient either, I'm sorry for China, but it's not sufficient either to have a point-based system. Uh, point-based system are a tool. Most settlement countries do have point-based system, but having an open door policy and a point-based system does not make you necessarily attractive. You need to do more. One thing that is absolutely needed is the necessity to improve branding effort to promote the destination country as a safe, secure, welcoming, and open society. Uh, there are some very telling examples, notably the Australian campaign, the best job in the world. I don't know if you remember that, but that had a tremendous impact, not only on tourists, but on potential immigrants. Uh, Estonia is doing also extremely good job in promoting itself as the most digital country in the world, etc., uh, etc. Et so you need not only to have an open door policy, but brand your country as a welcoming one. Digitalization of the immigration system is necessary. I understand that China is going in that direction. This is very important, not only to speed up the processes, but to improve the client experience in terms of transparency and efficiency. It's also necessary to facilitate the uh, transferability of skills across borders. Uh, and in the OECD in general, uh, still a lot to be done here. One in two tertiary educated migrants in the OECD is ever inactive, unemployed, or overqualified in his or her job. So there's a big, big mismatch between uh, capacity to attract people and capacity to make the best use of their skills. Uh, I think this is important to think also in the context of a talent attractiveness strategy. And, and obviously, uh, <laughs> yes, I'm, I'm ending here. Uh, we need to take proactive steps to attract and retain international students. That will be mentioned in the next presentation. And for countries with large and young diaspora, as it is the case for China, uh, keeping the focus on returning migrants is also very important. And I will end it. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Dumont, and a very informative uh, uh, presentation. And I think uh, we need uh, uh, time to, you know, digest. And but uh, it's very insightful. And uh, next, I would like to invite uh, another expert to uh, present uh, also very informative uh, uh, research. Uh, he is uh, uh, Mr. Igor uh, Hima Fig. Uh, is uh, chief methodologist of uh, Mul uh, multicultural insights, uh, USC. Uh, they are also our partner of this uh, forum. Please. Dr. Miao, Dr. Blair, Dr. Dumont. Ms. Li Wen, ladies and gentlemen. Multicultural Insight and I personally, very grateful to the possibility to present to this distinguished forum. Um, the research that we are to share today is a survey of Chinese graduate students in the United States. Those are the, just the preliminary results and uh, without further ado, according to Statista, in academic year 2022-2023, there were approximately 300,000 Chinese graduate students in the United States. Um, we were wondering of their experiences while studying in the United States and their post-graduation aspirations. Um, so we put together a survey with the uh, question in mind of what would be the intention of those graduate students to remain in the United States or to return to China. The survey included several domains, such as policy factors, reasons to study in the United States, education in the United States versus in China, and those were attitudes, economic factors, 
cultural and social networking and demographic uh, factors. We have uh, used big data technology to develop the original mailing list by creating a model that scrape the internet, uh, scrape the university websites for Chinese names. We used a PIN spelling and a machine learning model with 98% accuracy to develop the original list. Then personal emails were uh, sent to those uh, students asking them to complete the survey. Uh, we obtained a sample of 1,252 uh, participants uh, with a 63% response rate. 43% of Chinese graduate students reported that they plan to remain in the United States, at least for some time. Yet 40% are planning to return to China. 17% of the students stated that they don't yet know of what they're going to do after the graduation. We took a closer look in this 17% and uh, here are some uh, information on those students. 76% of them are male. 56% reported to be the only child. 54% were students majoring in applying scientific in applied scientific field. 61% of them were students in Ivy League institutions. The age distribution was by modal with modes at 23 and 31. We further asked them in which country they would prefer to work after the graduation. Uh, in this slide, you see the disaggregation between the uh, country where they will apply and the ideal situation, an ideal situation where would they prefer to work after the graduation. You see that 67% in first uh, case and 59% in the later case reported they will uh, try to apply uh, for work in the United States, yet 33% said that they would apply to work in China. 41%, however, stated that ideally that they would prefer to work in China. We Later we looked into the reasons why students decided to study in the United States. The um, three highest ranking responses were I wanted to experience life in the United States, I wanted to get the best education possible, and I wanted to have access to cutting edge technology. The response that received the lowest percentage at 35% was I wanted to live in a different country and getting education in the United States is the first step in that direction. We asked the students where they would prefer to work after the graduation. 52% reported industry while 44% stated that their ideal place of employment would be academia. We disaggregated the responses to a all thing consider which policies or measures would more encourage you to, re to return to China. We disaggregated these responses among students who reported they, they will plan to remain in the US and that they will return to China. We could see that three highest ranking responses, they are the, in terms of ranking, they are the same in both categories. Providing one-time incentive for returning overseas talents and their families, providing financial support for overseas talents and their families, and providing assistance for the relocation of spouses of overseas talents. Further disaggregation contained Ivy League schools, 
and those are eight, I believe, schools uh, in the United States, versus R1, research one institutions according to uh, Carnegie classification. Um, the three highest responses here were providing financial support for overseas talent and their families, providing assistance for the relocation of spouses of overseas talents, and providing one-time incentives for returning overseas talents and their families. Here the disaggregation is in terms of the program where students are enrolled. We see that this the first three ranking responses are much more important to students in doctoral programs than students in who were obtaining master degree. The next step, we constructed a predictive model to look at facilitators and blockers of returning to China remaining in the United States. We found that the strongest facilitator, the two strongest facilitator of uh, returning to China were providing one-time incentives for returning overseas talents and their families. And this uh, factor was um, statistically significant and uh, students who uh, reported that this factor is important were 3.5 times more likely to remain in the United States. Providing support for returning overseas talents was another important factor. And students who reported that this factor is important were three times more likely to return to China compared to those who were planning to remain in the United States. And finally, the policy of household restrictions was a factor in decision making whether to return to China or remain in the United States. Students who stated that they were planning to remain in the United States were 4.7 times more likely to indicate the significance of this factor compared to those who were planning to return. Asking students who were planning to return to China what are the reasons for pursuing career in China the three highest ranking responses were, I've, it will be hard for me to stay in the US because of my Chinese nationality. I will have more opportunities to work in high growth industries if I return to China. And I feel more comfortable working in my native language environment. We could clearly see the ethnic and linguistic preferences here. In um, asking the same questions, uh, students who plan to remain in the United States, uh, what are the factors for pursuing career in the United States? The uh, three highest ranking re uh, responses were, I feel I will make as much or more money in the United States than in China. I will have better access to training and development programs in the United States. And I feel that the US education will make me competitive in the US job market. In the next section, we ask students whether they are aware of programs or activities in China designed to support professionals who are planning to return to China after extended stay abroad, for example, studying or studying and then working. 40% indicated that they were aware of those activities. Um, among those 40%, 27 stated that they see these programs as effective. We follow up with a question asking students to stay um, qualitatively, asking them to stay what is the, uh, what are those, to be effective, what are those programs should be focusing for. And what you see here is a word chart um, indicating the prevalence of a single word response. Uh, you could see that um, 
students were most likely to respond that programs that indicate the patriotism uh, are important. Yet, you also see that salary is uh, a factor that uh, students would like the program to concentrate on. We ask three main, for students to specify three main reasons why they intend to return to China. And those are the responses for, from students who were planning to return to China. The highest ranking factor is family reunification. Second factor is good economic prospects in China. And third is the social networking. Asking the same questions from students who intend to remain in the United States, we see the prevalence of economic and political stability, as well as the good career prospects in the United States. We wanted students to share their educational journey in the United States, specifically, um, whether they had experiences listed in this slide. We see that 68% of students report that they were discriminated against off campus because of their Chinese nationality. We also see that 60% reported being discriminated on campus because of their Chinese nationality. 49% stated that they heard racial slurs like go home, go back to China, go back to your own country, shouted at them or their fellow Chinese students on campus. I was pressured to offer opinion on the current affair involving China by my American peers or the professors. 22% of students endorsed this response. I decided, uh, I'm sorry, I defended China's COVID-19 policies in front of my American peers or professors. The endorsement to this response was 19%. I was unjustly accused of using AI, artificial intelligence, such as ChatGPT, to produce my work in my graduate program. 16% of students said yes to this, to this question. I defend the Chinese government in front of my American peers or professors. 15% responded yes. We have a managing director of ETS here in the audience. I was unjustly accused by professors of cheating on standardized tests such as TOEFL, GRE, or GMAT and such to get the, into the graduate school, 11% of Chinese graduate students endorsed the response. And finally, I was unjustly accused by students on cheating on these tests, also 11%. In terms of Chinese students' attitudes towards American democracy, 71% stated that American democracy is money dominated. 45% agreed with the statement that American democracy is effective in maintaining order. 42% agreed with the statement that American democracy has lost its appeal for the American people. 41% said that the one party system is better than multi party system for any country. And 22% stated that American democracy is a true democracy. In terms of the future aspirations of students, 74% stated that they plan to obtain optional practical training, OPT. It's a work permit to remain in the country. And especially if you're a STEM student, you under today's immigration law in the United States, you are eligible to apply for up to three years uh, to work and gain experience, and gain experience um, under this program. 55% plan to obtain a work visa, H-1B. 
only 42% plan to obtain permanent residence, and even less, 29% plan to obtain U.S. citizenship. 68% of students who reported that they plan to return to China will still want to obtain OPT. And 24% of those who return to China plan to obtain H-1B visa. We asked a very interesting question. I am an Asian, and therefore, I can never be American. 58% of respondents endorsed this question. We're now moving to the final uh, part of the survey, and those are demographics. You could see in this slide the distrib distribution by gender. Um, over 70% of the respondents were male, and this is a limitation of the survey. Uh, majority, as uh, you would expect with the average age of 28, were single, and majority were the only child. The takeaway points, overall, at least 40% of Chinese graduate students in the United States plan to return to China. 17% are still to decide. Only 43% stated that they plan to remain in the United States. In terms of demographic characteristics, more male than female student consider they're returning to China after graduation. And it might be logical because uh, in Chinese culture, male are taking care of the parents. More students in R1 University, research one according to Carnegie classification, plan to remain in the United States versus in the Ivy League schools. Eliminating household restrictions for overseas talents would encourage one more students to return to China. Majority of students who plan to return to China believe that it will be hard for them to remain in the United States because of their Chinese nationality. In this last slide, you could see the snapshot of the institutions that were represented in our sample. I appreciate your attention and the opportunity to speak to you. Thank you, thank you, Igor. Uh, thank you for sharing. And I hear that your, uh, this research will you know, uh, formally uh, publish in the end of the, uh, June. So we are looking forward to your final uh, results. Uh, and next uh, is uh, a jointly uh, report release uh, by the uh, CCG and also by the Yingzhong Overseas Consulting. Uh, so we'd like to invite uh, two uh, authors. Uh, one is uh, the CCG Vice President, Head of uh, Research Senior Fellow, uh, Dr. Zheng Jinglian. Another is the uh, Senior Council Member of CCG, form Founder and President of uh, Yingzhong Overseas Consulting, Partner of uh, Yingzhong Law Office, uh, Mr. Guo Shizhe. Please. The floor is yours. Thank you. This report is a joint release by CCG and uh, Yin Zhong. And this support uh, would be impossible without the support of our partners in terms of data and uh, funding. The name of the report is the International Talent and Mobility and the Governance. We analyze the United States. There are four parts. Just now, our colleagues from IOM and the OECD uh, spoke about the, the landscape of uh, talent mobility worldwide. And we analyze the flow of international talent in the United States. And we conclude by providing suggestions for China in terms of the flow of international talents. In doing this research, we find two things very interesting. 
first that there is a intense global competition for talents. The U.S. is the choice destination for international students and international talents. And this trend did not change before and after the pandemic. And there are f two important uh, groups of uh, migrants. One is uh, professional visa applicants. Uh, we see applicants from China to the U.S., from uh, Europe to the U.S., and from India to the U.S. We see that the number uh, increased by 11.5 percent than before the pandemic. There are some changes in many countries. For example, in China, it came back to 64 percent, and Europe, 87 percent. The India grew by 50 percent. For international students, in 2019 and in 2023, the data doesn't make much difference. In aggregate terms, we analyzed uh, the UK, France, and Germany, and the China and the India students studying in the United States. We found that in 2023, China came back to 77.7 percent before COVID-19. Europe, no much change. India grew by about 40 percent. The second discovery is that after COVID-19, India rapidly has risen to number one source of international students for the United States, and also a source of uh, people who get uh, working visa. So you can see it's growing very fast. On the left, you can see the graph. It grew by 50%. That was 6.5 times that of China and 1.9 times that of Europe. In terms of international students from India to the United States, the students' number grew very fast. You can look at the right graph. In 2019, from 19, 2019, it grew to over 260,000. So we have reached this conclusion. So in 2016, when we joined the IOM, the national authorities said that now China has become a single source of uh, migrants or Passover country. Uh, and now it has become uh, a source of uh, uh, other people, or that is to say we have become a diversified source of uh, migrants. And uh, we want to improve uh, the migration system and establish uh, a, a comprehensive uh, international student system, improve governance, improve international cooperation, and encourage civic co-governance and an open visa policy and internationalized uh, environment. And uh, these are the data for international talent. And Mr. Guo will give us more information on that. Okay. Dr. Mel, and Dr. Zheng, and, and Ms. Levin, good afternoon. I'm distinguished good afternoon. I'm a great honor to be here, and we're glad to see you all. And um, I'm the CEO of Injun Consulting Firm, and I'm partner of Injun Law Offices in the U.S. So today, it's my great honor to publish the Global Talent and Mobility and the Government's Report, analyzed with the United States as hub. And uh, since the time, the time is very limited, so I only have about 10 minutes, so I, speak, I will speak Chinese for the rest of my report. Um, I know some of the immigration uh, department uh, uh, people are here. We are now launching this uh, report with CCG. This is about international talent governance. We want to look at the global mobility trend and uh, the uh, 
destination countries' policies to improve uh, talent uh, attraction and uh, retention. This is what we want to learn from them. And from the data, we also want to inspire China about what they can do to improve talent uh, attraction and retention. First, India is a big uh, country with a lot of competitiveness, and we made a lot of analysis on India. And we have also selected uh, the United States and Western European countries for analysis. If we look at the global talent mobility, I don't want to go into details of analysis. So could you please uh, play the slides for me? Yes, page two. We have selected uh, three samples. For example, China to the United States, e, the uh, European students to the United States, and we have made some definitions. First, non-migrants working technical visas. We know that working visas have long-term and short-term and technical and non-technical, just like labor visas. And the non-migrant technical visas are singled out here. Second, professional technical migrants as uh, uh, was uh, taken out. We know that we have a professional and investment uh, migrants example, but uh, we only take uh, professional samples. And uh, also, we profile all international students. As Ms. Madam Zheng said that uh, first, in the past uh, three years after COVID-19, all of the pro three profiles actually have been reduced in terms of nature. A number actually it just uh, returned to 60 percent of the past but India's profiling is very surprising the total number from uh, 2019 to 2022 grew to 121 percent of the past and uh, for the international students uh, China were just returned to the 77 percent of the past but India grew by 139%. So that is a big surprise. And we also used the United States as a case, analyzing its talent attraction and retention methods. And we also analyzed the samples of Chinese students, Indian students, and European students to the United States. We want to look at their differences. We look at the O1 visa, and we also look at the EB1A. We got uh, the backstage data from the Immigration Bureau for these groups. First, uh, what about Chinese talents moving to the United States? On the left, we can see that uh, all of the non-migration working visa and uh, talent visa. We made uh, the analysis starting from 2019. It has been going down very obviously. And starting from 2021, it started to recover, but not uh, fully back to the past level. And uh, we also look at uh, the four categories of uh, H-1B and uh, L visa and O visa and J visa. And we believe these four categories are highly representative. And if you look at the short-term working visas, uh, these four short-term visas have uh, been going down drastically. And in 2023, it just went back to the past half, uh, half level. And if you look at the second picture, that is to say, when we look at the talent profiling, that is the migration profiling. On the left, we selected the EB1 
then the you know, talent, the professors and uh, executives, etc., and EB5, for example, we believe that uh, they are highly representative for Chinese migrants. So they are actually showing a different trend from 2019 to 2022. It was uh, going up, actually. That is to say, in this group, uh, the Chinese migrants grew by a fold, especially for professional ones. And uh, on the right, the figure came from uh, the Immigration Bureau, and it's about uh, EB1A. And uh, we can also see the Chinese profiling for this group, and the peak came in 2017. Over 3,000 applications were approved from China by the United States. About 65 to 80 percent were approved. But in recent years, it has been going down. That is the profiling of the Chinese migrants. But the migrants are rising, actually. If you look at European countries on the left, we can look at the migrants. Actually, the total number was also affected during the COVID-19, but uh, one year earlier than China, it came back to the pre-COVID level. And on the right, uh, that was also the working visa profiling for Europe. It was also going back to the pre-COVID level very fast. And uh, you know, China has no E2 or E1. There is some difference between China and Europe. And um, actually, we can see that the European migrants number has changed a little. But if you look at the technical talent profiling, it's not much. Every year, it's about 20,000 visas every year, much less than China, but it's stabilizing. And uh, the outstanding talents visas is also much less than Chinese. I selected uh, the UK, France, and Germany. So every year it's about uh, 400 to 800, but for Chinese it's uh, about 3,600 to 4,200. But their approval rate is uh, stabilizing at 70% for the three European countries. If you look at India, if you look at the working visas on the left, actually, after COVID-19, it is the single country that sees much increase. So we can see a lot of profiling of Indian talents moving to the United States. That also fits into the picture of uh, international students, actually. And if you look at uh, India's HLOJ rapid rise, but India's samples have something different because uh, H visa takes much share, but L visas takes a small share. And for migrants during COVID-19, it uh, grew by two or three times, much more than China. And uh, EB1A profiling for India, every year applicants ranked number two after China only, but uh, the approval rate is about 50% to 67%, so a little bit lower. And if you look at the approval trend, uh, actually the Immigration Bureau of the United States actually do not differentiate it between the Chinese and India and European countries. Actually, when the approval rate decrease, uh, decreases, all these uh, three countries or three regions' uh, approval rates are decreasing, actually. So now I'd like to talk about uh, the future research direction for U.S. talent management. You can go to CCG website to download the 58-page report, and the information is in the report. Actually, the core of uh, U.S. talent attraction strategy is STEM, science, technology, engineering, and math. So. Everything is focused on the four aspects. So in 2022, including 2023 and 2024, 
all of the migration act or competitive act are all related to the support for STEM, including the increase their stay in the United States and reduce, relax the requirements on them. Uh, the data shows that for STEM majors and investment in natural science increased by 7% to 13% every year. So the biggest investment is in STEM in the United States. So core competitive talents are all about STEM. For example, last year, about 50.3% international students came to the United States for STEM majors. And the report has 58 pages. It has a lot of data. And we also want to thank the CCG and also the AGTO and our own partner and who have been working together to complete this report. You know, time is limited. I will have to finish here. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Go, and thank you, Ms. Chen, for presenting the report. Indeed, all the uh, authors have made ex important contribution to this report. And now we move on to the panel, the panel discussion. Uh, we indeed we are ahead of uh, the schedule. Uh, I will try to uh, catch up. And uh, I know uh, a professor from the audience has something to make comment on the reports.
to save time, to save time, I will speak Chinese to moderate this uh, panel discussion, uh, so that uh, we can be more efficient. Uh, I hope to hear from views or from all the panelists. Uh, I won't introduce uh, the panelists one by one. I will ask them questions. Uh, the first question will give to. Uh, 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 Dr. Uh, David Blair, uh, uh, you are the economist, so I want to ask uh, uh, from your, uh, you know, expertise, what is the importance of uh, international mobility for the innovation? Let me, let me try to approach that in terms of non uh, I spend a good bit of time in rural China, and one phenomenon that I've seen a lot of, and I think is transformative, is people who have gone to the big cities, worked there, often in menial jobs, delivery guys, uh, I know some people that sold flowers on the street in Guangzhou, uh, things like that, and they develop skills. I mean, I think we have to be careful what we mean by skills and what we mean by talent. And then they return to their home villages or near their home villages, and they build a business that employs tens or hundreds of people, and they become rich. I mean, I've met people that, you know, this delivery guy in Shanghai, he goes back to his hometown in uh, uh, Jiangxi province, uh, grows Chinese yu plants, and he makes a lot of money. Uh, people, I know people in Kunming that work at the Donan Flower Market, which is a sort of electronic flower trading market. They sold flowers on the street. They said, I can get into flowers. They go back. They're, now they're dollar millionaires. So that's, that's talent. Uh, in terms of international talent, I think we're seeing a lot of, um, a lot of specialized talent helping build clusters. I mean, that's basically what we're seeing is very, especially like in Silicon Valley, a lot of that was built by very highly specialized talent, which a lot of it's from India, some from China, uh, who have skills, and, and they transfer their skills to the cluster. Now, I do think it's important that it goes back the other way. I mean, it's, it's a complete loss for China or India if they have a, com a permanent brain drain. If those people don't move to India, or they don't move back to China, or they don't go back to Nigeria, or Uganda, or wherever, that worries me a lot if we're concentrating uh, the brains of the world in a few places. I'm also worried if we're building sort of a class of people who don't have much connections to the places where they live or to their home countries. That's that's what Lenin called rootless cosmopolitans. I think that's, that's a worrying trend too. Uh, let me just say on, on another topic. Um, it's not only economics that this is important for. It's also, I think, for world peace too. Because one of my favorite songs is a 1983 song by Sting. And it says, the title is, I hope the Russians learn, love their children too. And it sounds kind of silly, doesn't it? But I remember in meetings about that same time, sort of one of the most tense periods of the Cold War, I remember I particularly st strikes me one meeting I was in where someone said, uh, was talking about countervalue targets. And I said, yeah, I'm not familiar with that term. What is a countervalue target? Turns out it's blowing up a city. Uh, and you're not going to talk about countervalue targets if you've seen children playing in Beijing or you've seen children playing in Moscow or wherever, and vice versa. So I, I think this international exchange of people gives a, a kind of education that you know, explains to everybody that people are people. And I, I you know, in a way, it, it does sound silly that we have to say that, but I think we do. And I think this sort of 
uh, people-to-people relationship, that international talent exchanges is a very important thing from that regard. I look at, uh, you know, pe- one thing that worries me is that there are very many Chinese that know the United States very well. There are very few the other way around. Uh, but I think that's changing too. I know that in the United States now, um, if you have worked for a long time or studied in China, it's going to limit your job prospects in the future. I mean, I, I'm married to a Chinese woman. I don't think I could ever get a job in the White House. Um, and I, I'm old enough that I don't care. But if I were 30, I would probably care. And so, and I, I, it may be somewhat going the other way, too. So I, I think we need to be very careful to remove st- stigma and fear from, from international talent exchange, too. So I'm, I'm out of town, but I, I think economics is important, but other factors are just as important. Okay, thank you. You said uh, uh, more things beyond the economics. I think, uh, yeah, right now, I think the, the culture and the, the, the understanding of each other is even more uh, important than the economic issues. Yeah, that is the fundamental things. Thank you. Uh, and the uh, next question, I, uh, I think, is the most important uh, uh, questions, I think. <laughs> I want to give uh, our two... Uh, experts from the uh, uh, international organizations. Uh, one is working in the UNESCO and another is working in the UN headquarters for uh, many years. Uh, maybe I give the, the, the madam first. Uh, uh, you have uh, worked in the United Nations for many years and uh, in the morning session, we uh, a lot of people talk about the Global South and also the Dr. Mabel Miao also talk about this unfair, you know, uh, talent mobility. So, what is your opinion? You know uh, how to uh, mitigate this challenge associated with the brain drain in the developing countries or so-called global south, while promoting the global talent mobility. You can try. You can try. Um, thank you very much. Good afternoon. I'm very happy to be with you. Dr. Miao, thank you very much for inviting us. Um, We not only spoke about the um, talent mobility in Global South, but we talk about globalization. And some people, they were very negative about mobilization by simply saying, oh, this is an old world, this is belonging to Second World War, and we really have to come up with a new terminology and new system. And some others, they were hoping that we can do some repair of the broken system and come up with something which is more accommodable. I think talent mobility is one of the most important factor of globalization. If globalization did not exist, talent mobility could not really develop as much as it has in these days and age. Um, It was only because of that probably that I'm sitting here today, Um, born in Iran, educated in Canada, worked in the United States, in New York at the United Nations, married a German, and then now I live in Paris and work partly in China. So this is the world of globalization. And the fact that I am no longer in a country where I was born in, but I am working in an international community where the diversity of culture is part and parcel of it. I consider that a very positive development. However, Global South, if we don't take China as part of it, I believe it's, it's a loser. In the world of technology today, um, companies, enterprises, uh, governments, they are all after talents. They are all after skilled workers. And naturally, if there is any investment in developing countries, will be an investment in those areas where talent could be developed and could be snatched, could be used in a proper area where these enterprises are really headquartered. So your 
my, my colleague over here, my friend said, there's no such a thing as brain drain, but I can tell you it is. Uh, is the fact of the matter is the person, an individual, may be part of this brain circulation is good for them because you may or may not find a new opportunity to grow. But unfortunately, the country uh, where you were born in and the country that invested in your education, invested in your livelihood, is going to be a loser. And that we have seen it all over the place, around the world. This is something which, of course, the developing countries particularly, they can prevent it to a great extent by um, improving their education, improving their work condition, improving social uh, and economic performances, and also invest further in technological innovation. But it's all easier said than done. Um, we know very well the disparity between various countries, and we know very well, as we heard about a few minutes ago, some close to 45 to 60 percent of talented students that they study in the United States, they would not like really to return to their country of origin. So um, the winners are, are the best, are the developing countries, are the developed countries, and the loser for the time being are the developed ones, but the developing one. But the, on the other hand, not necessarily every individual who is being brought as a talent to the different world is going to be used properly. We are talking about brain waste. A number of individuals, they cannot find job, they cannot fit into the new society, they do not speak the language, they are completely different as far as tradition is concerned, and they feel very lonely. So most of these people that they are being brought by big enterprises after a few days or a few months or a few years feel that they no longer belong to that society. However, some of them are, I think they face the reality that it may be a little bit late to go back where they're coming from. Thank you very much. Thank you, madam. Uh, so the same question goes to uh, Mr. Hans. Uh, what's your take on this, how to make the global telemobility more fair and more inclusive? Well, I think what we have heard from the various very interesting studies is just a limited part of what talent mobility can do. As David said, uh, talent is skill and it is a primary resource for the economy to, to grow. But it is not only the student, <coughs> it is also that we need teachers and experts in order to uh, provide the knowledge and the skills and the, the building of capacities of students. So it's already a second element. We have on the one hand the student, on the second uh, element we have uh, the teachers and the experts. And uh, to operate exchanges, uh, we need intercollegiate exchanges. And I was very struck, I was last week at the Board of Trustees of Tongji University in Shanghai, and I was listening for three hours, and they only talk about their uh, cooperation with Politecnico, Milano, with uh, France, with Nantes, with uh, German technical universities, and with Spain. Nothing about the United States. So I dare to ask the question, how is it Aren't you the putative leader of the Global South? Where are your cooperation with Cairo University, with uh, uh, Johannesburg, Cape Town universities, uh, with universities in Buenos Aires? There is no interaction on that. So the talents which they are focusing on are just the talents of the North. How can they inject the capacities and the skills which are highly priced in the north, also to the students then from, uh, from China. So to me, there is a point when we talk about globalization and talent mobility that we have to see it much broader. Next point is for, I've been now two months in China and reading newspapers to the extent that I can left and right. It is very striking that the cities, Shanghai, Beijing, Shenzhen are developing talent
programs and talent mobility programs, which are not only university or school programs, they are also how do you take talents and put them to work in the city activities and in the cities, or be it water management, or be it tourism management, whatever you, you, you could do there. So the, the talent uh, dimension is much more diverse than just looking at the university. You have to see what creative cities, which require talents, can do in order to attract them, in order to build them, and in order to share the skills uh, which they have. Fourth point, industrial ecosystems, if I would call it that way. You see many Chinese, and I have spoken to uh, quite a number of them, who uh, are proud of having signed up with uh, big companies, car companies, electrical companies, uh, Siemens, American companies. And there they're going in order to uh, acquire also a higher degree of talent. So when we are looking at talents, I think we need also studies in how that relates to the industrial ecosystem in, in a particular way, or if you look at labs also, uh, you know, if you go to the bio biochemistry and so on, this is a very important element which you cannot only acquire. The issue of the talent is, of course, one of selectivity, because the students who go, for example, from here to the United States or to Europe are being selected in a very rigorous and competitive manner. What would happen if it would be all open and they would uh, apply by themselves uh, to the universities uh, to study or then much earlier on to schools because you have at the, at the school level, you have already exchanges before you enter university and that is, this predates in a, in, in a way the, uh, uh, the preparation of, of talents. So to me, we have to look a little bit broader in the talent mobility equation, uh, what, we are, what we are looking at and how we see that this is moving globalization ahead. If we are in a time where people are skeptical about globalization, let's re-globalize with a much broader approach. Okay, thank you. You really give uh, us a more, you know, a big picture uh, to uh, our background of the global talent mobility. And now I'd like to give the floor to an academics, Professor Liu Guofu. And I know you have long been engaged in research on uh, technical migrants. And uh, I think I want to invite you to say something from your perspective. Um, so in the post-COVID era, what can we do to do a better job in international talent and mobility, or in terms of policies, what we can do to adapt to the new changes. Thank you uh, for your question. Uh, I would like to express my thanks for the kind of invitation from CCG and uh, Dr. Jinian. Uh, it's a very good opportunity to express my preliminary understanding about uh, uh, global talent attraction policies, especially under the background of China. So as you, you know, it's, it's a good uh, chance to learn from all speakers here. You introduce lots of uh, international uh, experience and the practice for, for us and for I think both of people here. So I'm thinking how to you know, learn it and uh, merge into Chinese national uh, situation. As a global talent attraction policies, I'm thinking, so well, who is, who are uh, talents? So no, even it's case by case. For different countries or different uh, institutions or companies, they have their attitudes. So, uh, but for the more, you only we need one criteria to issue a visa or resident uh, card. So it's a little bit of contradiction. So uh, for the tenants, you only it's a term of uh, human resource or management. But for skilled migrant, it's a term of uh, more or policy. So uh, we need, you know, uh, transfer from the 
tenant attraction policies into skill migration policies, but it's not enough. We also need to have political stability, environment, and economical, uh, you know, innovation and mad culture and, uh, you know, a uh, very convenient, facilitated environment for people, foreigners living here. So, so that, that, that's it's, uh, the way how to, you know, for one country such as China, developing countries to attract foreigners. foreigners. And last thing is for the, you know, nation psychological thinking. For my, most of so nation state, they wouldn't like, honestly speaking, foreigners very much. Sometimes they keep them away and have some uh, inside uh, Im immigrant hate and discrimination against them. So we need a very you know, strong and clear attitude to fight against them. We must create a welcome and a friendly and open and a transparent for, for the foreigners and it requires our, you know, to deep, open, you know, policy. So, another one is for the, you know, some countries, you need to have the tenant attraction policy to control. They pay more attention to the security. They worry about the more foreigners would endanger their national security or public security, or, you know, they may be um, uh, very not very much about uh, public service. You know, some companies you wouldn't like provide very, you know, easy uh, environment for foreigners because they think it costs a lot of money because foreigners it's, uh, it's a small group. You know, compared with the local people, it's a very, very small group. So we must, you know, uh, try to collaborate or persuade the, the, the relevant stakeholders to attitude, the, 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 the thinking. So the foreigners, it's not only you know, benefit for themselves, but also benefit for the, our country, and for the sending country and the receiving country. Generally, we need to have benefit for all. I think this will be much better, yeah, okay. Thank you very much, Professor Liu. I think you talked about the definition of talent. I think we needed to have a good concept. I visited Hong Kong just recently, and they were asking about the definition of talent. And they say that if we can stay in Hong Kong, they can find a job in Hong Kong, then we will attract a such kind of talent. So it's not like uh, a certain department is setting a standard for talent attraction. So everything will be determined by the market or by the companies. So now we will invite uh, another speaker from uh, the educational circle, Madam Wang Mengyan. So as the president of ETS, this is a famous educational or a test assessment agency. What is your view about the trend and challenge and responses for global talent mobility? Thanks, John. Um, and uh, personally, I think I benefit a lot from the international education. And uh, now my whole career is with international education. And I'm very glad to share with all the audience about how we observe uh, the mobility of the talents in China. So ETS is the world's largest uh, nonprofit organization for assessment. So every year we cover over 200 countries and we provide testing services to over 50 million. Uh, talents and uh, people are not, may not aware about the company name ETS, but I, I bet you have heard of uh, TOEFL, GRE, TOEIC, which are all our testing brands. And I believe that why Chinese has a such why ETS gained a very high reputation in China is because that TOEFL has entered China in four uh, over 40 years. And uh, for the past uh, four decades, we have witnessed the whole history of Chinese talents who pursue their international study, and they got uh, realize their dreams and uh, get a better life, and then maybe return or stay in other countries. So when people talk about TOEFL, it's more like their uh, shared memory. So that's why we have a very solid foundation. And the next, uh, I want to share a little bit about our nation, uh, Chinese uh, policy uh, regarding to the overseas study. And uh, from the, our testing data, 
uh, we have to admit that after the pandemic, our test volume was uh, greatly impacted during the pandemic. But we do see there is a very steady growth after pandemic, especially for 2023. And uh, we foresee this trend will continue to grow, but not in a very fasting speed. So um, I think we have read a lot of research and reports, uh, which echoes also with the previous report that India might be uh, overpass, uh, well surpass China to be the number one source country. But uh, we have to admit that China is still very important and uh, we have uh, such a big population, Chinese young people still wants to go overseas study. Uh, so that's why uh, within ETS, we still adhere to the policy that uh, we will empower Chinese talents to pursue their dream everywhere in the globe. So from the assessment organization like ETS, uh, we are not only providing services as assessment, but also we are thinking about how we can advance educational fairness and also to help people to upskill and help, help them to cultivate them into international talents. So just the last month, ETS has completely rebranded and we upgrade our strategy and our region. So we now currently, we will focus more on um, upskill people, like our um, mission convert to people forward, uh, which also echoes with a lot of experts that we think people is the core, is the soul of the whole mobility thing. And uh, we will not only provide assessment, but also to provide more training, certificates, and uh, working with all the non uh, governments and globalized uh, and organizations, you know, to customize some solutions for their localized talent policy, as well as the international talents policy. And I do also want to just uh, um, 30 minutes to highlight, I think uh, ETS will still serve as a bridge for people-to-people -people exchange, and China still welcomes international students, and Chinese students also want to go to the broader stage. Thank you. Thank you for saving us uh, 15 seconds. I previously heard a uh, presentation from by Ms. Wang. You are from a testing service organization. Actually, you have a community. Um, you have um, the students. You have uh, the parents. They are very active about international education. So how to provide better services for them? and how to bring them together. Um, these are very important uh, area for cooperation. Next, I give the floor to uh, our next panelist. I give you one minute. I have to give you one minute to state your ideas. Is it my turn now? Yeah. <laughs> one minute. You said one minute? <clears throat> thank you, thank you, John. Well, um, I would like to say what what is our departure in that, and there's what is uh, in our book, what is our uh, suggestion to the Danish government, uh, and that is that what we need is to ensure that we have a system of mobility, uh, that the system of mobility becomes norm, and that we move towards the mobile geographies rather than uh, sedentary ones that, at, at least from a global point of perspective. The way we, we kind of approach it is a kind of a triple win expert talent model, which is that we have a multi-scale policy for government, we have the individual that wins, and then we have the business sector. So what, what the, the, the approach is that, uh, uh, that uh, we do believe that innovation always comes from the outside. If we are in a closed network, what happens is that whatever I know is the same thing as you know. So we need to have an outsider to bring with some new information. Based on that, in our uh, the triangle, we try to uh, make something new. The newness comes from, from the outside. This is the kind of uh, the point of departure that Professor Bert, Ronald Bert, has in his uh, structural uh, holes theory long time ago, 20, 30, 40 years ago. So, uh, and that is the reason that all countries with respect for themselves, they have a, 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 a talent strategy and talent policy. 
talent recruitment policy and talent ret uh, retainment policy program. And one thing is important to underline here, that will be my last wo uh, words, and that is that talents, they know they are special, they are, uh, they are uh, wanted, and they know that there is a global hunt on talents, and we are mainly here, what we focus on is STEM talents and uh, uh, high-level talents, also in sports. And those kind of talents, they are not loyal. When I say they are not loyal, that means that they know somebody else is standing next door who wants to hire them. Another country Sorry, wants Professor, to Sorry, <laughs> I so, need to give so you our that is, that is the last thing I want to say, and that is uh, we need to treat normal migrants and talents in two different ways, and we need to have two different setup and two different uh, rules and regulations for them. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Uh, thank you all the panelists, but I suggest you to stay on the stage because I suggest to have a group photo later with all speakers today. Uh, but uh, the last but not least, I want to uh, invite uh, 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 Mr. Frank uh, Lazok, it's actually the behind the scene, uh, but uh, please uh, help me to project the Zoom uh, thing on the screen. Uh, uh, Frank, Frank Lazok is the senior advisor to the Multicultural Insights and uh, the former director of uh, uh, LOM Global Migration Data Analysis Center. And uh, he is uh, doing a lot uh, coordination for the, to make this uh, uh, session happen. So I want to invite him to uh, have a concluding remarks. Please, Frank. Thank you so much, John. I hope you can all hear me. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I would like to thank the Center for China Globalization for organizing this event. Um, my first message is that we really need more dialogue in this area uh it's as we heard from the oecd representative nearly a quarter of all international students come from china and so when there are international discussions about talent mobility and how to attract and retain talent it's very important that china is included in these sorts of discussions and that we have more fora like the one that has been organized today um, my other key takeaway from today is that uh, policymakers around the world are increasingly interested in talent and attracting and retaining talent from different perspectives and they sometimes disagree some countries want to retain talent, others want to encourage talent to return. But one thing that all policymakers need and have in common is a desire for much better data on this subject. And I hope that the, uh, we've been able to demonstrate today that the Multicultural Insights Survey serves a useful purpose for policymakers and can be a useful cost-effective and rapid policy tool. It provides information for policymakers in China on the reasons why people want to return to China or remain in country, OECD countries. It provides information on uh, why uh, students are attracted to certain countries. It provides information also on their awareness of some of the return incentives that China has implemented in recent years to try and attract people to return. It's also a very useful policy instrument and tool for OECD countries because it, it provides them with information about uh, the reasons why uh, students are attracted to certain countries, the, re the ty types of jobs they want to do, and um, the reasons why they want to stay. So I, I would encourage all of you to think about two things as we move forward. One is, and these are the two Ds, not the three Ds. One is more dialogue. We definitely need more dialogue. And secondly, we definitely need, need more data. And I would certainly encourage some of the other countries, particularly the EU countries, to think about replicating the survey that was conducted in the US. There are more than 100,000 Chinese students, I believe, 
studying in EU countries, and the EU has stated that one of its key policy priorities is to promote an EU talent pool and attract uh, more migrants, uh, to highly skilled migrants to the EU. So I think we certainly need further data and research in, in that part of the world. Thank you very much for giving me this opportunity to speak today. And um, uh, I wish you a very successful end to your meeting. Thank you. Thank you, Frank. Uh, thank you. And uh, I invite all the speakers, uh, uh, in, including the online uh, speakers, to have a group photo uh, on the stage. Just add the D for diversity. <laughs> then you have a false D. Is Nelly online? Uh, Ali, you, if you are online, you can open the camera and uh, we can also uh, have you. Okay, okay. Maybe we go to the stairs.